speak softly in our hearing. Unsheath your sword. Turn to the second book of Moses, the book of Exodus. And I want to read from two significant places in the Holy Writ. In the 19th chapter of Exodus, beginning at verse 1 through verse 6, the New International Version will present to you these words. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And then in the 32nd chapter of that same book, the book of Exodus, the first verse, rather protracted, reads thusly. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Amen. You may be seated. When the pastor disappears, now tell us where have you been? Several years ago, Rick Warren, who pastors one of the largest evangelical mega churches in the nation, the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, wrote a marvelous book entitled the purpose-driven life. And in it, he talks about the purpose-driven church. Whenever we talk about purpose, we're talking about determination, about intention, about resolution. When you purpose to do something, you are intentional about that. You are resolute about that. There is a determination in you that seeks to obtain some objective. I believe in purpose because I believe that the unfocused life is a life that simply meanders. It wanders. It has no particular aim or objective in mind. But I'm somewhat at odds with Rick Warren because I believe that ultimately, before we talk about purpose, we have to talk about personality. I do not believe that the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is purpose-driven. I do believe that in one context, in the sense that the Church does have intent, and the Church does have determination. But there can be no intention, nor can there be determination, without a personality that pushes it. It is the personality that reveals the purpose. It is the personality that reveals the intent. It is the personality that reveals the objective. When it came time for Israel to have a king, 
God did not send them a purpose. God sent them a personality, namely David. When the time came for India to be liberated from British domination and rule, God did not send a purpose. He sent a personality, Mohandas K. Gandhi. In our own history, when we think about our liberation, when we think about our freedom and our pursuit of emancipation, God did not send us a purpose, but God sent us a personality, Martin Luther King, Jr. In every personality, there is embodied a purpose. And it becomes your responsibility and mine to recognize that God uses human instruments. Even though those instruments are sometimes flawed. When I think about the tragedy that occurred in Charleston, South Carolina this past week, how a pastor and eight of his wonderful disciples were murdered in a Bible study. And I think about the historical significance of that church, Mother Emmanuel, African Methodist Episcopal Church. A church founded 199 years ago in the year 1816, the oldest African Methodist Episcopal Church south of Baltimore, Maryland. And a church out of which a revolt started. Most of us have heard the name of Nat Turner. Yes. And we've heard the name of Gabriel Prosser. Yes, sir. But few of us have heard the name of Denmark Vesey. Yeah. Denmark Vesey was born in San Domingo and was a very learned man. Came to Charleston, South Carolina, purchased his freedom, joined the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And something about the debate of the Missouri Compromise and also had an understanding of the French Revolution as well as insurrections that occurred in Haiti. And yet he led a revolt in the city of Charleston out of Mother Emanuel Church in protests against slavery. And as a result, six years after that church was founded in 1822, Mother Emanuel Church was burned to the ground. And every black state of every black church in the state of South Carolina was burned and closed down. God always uses a personality. And one of the questions that you and I must always raise is, what has God determined for us as individuals when it comes to bringing forth some kind of purpose. Too many of us are drifting aimlessly through life with no sense of purpose at all and yet everybody is born with purpose because there is no such thing as an idle personality. And so here we come to this 19th chapter of Exodus and we wander away to the 32nd chapter to deal with a name and to deal with a personality that all of us are familiar with, Moses. For his name means he was drawn from the water. He was a man who has been tapped by God after 300 years of slavery to lead his people out of darkness into the light of liberation. Now, he's a rather strange figure and somebody very odd because when I think about God using human personality and God using Moses, I can understand then why God uses me. Because Moses, thoroughly Adair, was a flawed personality. He was a man who was by no means perfect. He killed a man, had his body burned in the, buried in the sand. He was a fugitive from justice. He grew up in the oppressor's palace. And he was suspect among his own people. 
who have you were born and raised from babyhood in the palace of the oppressor, and God chooses you to come out of the house of the oppressor to lead the oppressed. That means that if you're living in the oppressor's palace and you speak Hebrew, you had to speak Hebrew with an Egyptian accent which makes you suspect among your own people. Which is why Aaron was often chosen to be the mouthpiece for Moses. Because there were people who would not believe, who could not comprehend the fact that he was being used by God as the forceful, dynamic, and instrument to lead his people out of their incarceration to emancipation. Now having said that, there's hope for you and me. Don't you let anybody tell you that you can't be used by God because of a certain infraction or because of a certain flaw. God can use anybody he chooses. God can use people any way he wills to bring about his purpose. Here are the people of God who have come out of the wilderness. And they now come, Larry Price, to the foot of the mountain in the desert of Sinai. They come to the mount called Sinai. Now what most of us don't understand is that by the time we get to the 32nd chapter of Exodus, when Moses actually gets the commandments, that is his seventh trip to the top of the mountain. In other words, prior to chapter 32, he had already been up in the mountain to convene and converse with God at least six times. And God did that, that he might share with Moses regulations and rules that he wanted Israel to follow because he had come to Israel in the wilderness, but now it was time for the people of God to come to him in the mount. But in coming to the mount at Sinai, they could not come to him in just any form or fashion. In other words, you've got to observe certain rules. You don't just come into my presence like you come into a bar or like you go into a classroom or like you go into your house because my presence represents holiness. And that's a word that a whole lot of us Baptists are afraid of. Holiness does not mean perfection. Holiness means to be separate. It means to be distinct. Which is why the Bible says that you are to be in the world, but not of it. And some of us are so much immersed in it that we cannot be seen as different from anybody else. We dress like the world. Drink like the world. Cuss like the world. And we have no sense at all of where we are when we come to this place because if God had rules and regulations that Israel must follow when they came to the mount, there are rules and regulations that you must follow when you come to his house. You don't just get up on Sunday morning and come to church and some of you did just that. You got to prepare for worship. And when you prepare for worship, that's when you can enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's when you can come into his courts with praise. Now imagine, Moses has gone up into the mount and this is his seventh trip. He disappears for 40 days after the seventh trip. And at the foot of the mountain, Bob Chapman, are two million recently delivered slaves. I didn't say 200, I didn't say 2,000, I said two million slaves, incarcerated subjects, who had known nothing more than the lash and the whip of the Egyptian king. Men and women, boys and girls, who have been forced to make bricks out of straw. And now Moses has gone up for the seventh time, but this time 
he doesn't really come back. And after 40 days, they began to murmur among themselves, knowing who Moses is, knowing that he is the shepherd, knowing that he is the pastor, having already seen what he can do. They now say, we don't know what has become of this fellow Moses. What do you mean, this fellow? He's your pastor. He's your shepherd. Out of his personality has come the purpose for a nation. For you will be a peculiar people. A holy nation. A royal priesthood. And now you place him in a state of delegation. This fellow Moses. Where is he? How come he ain't come back? I disappeared 104 days ago. The last time that I was in here was on March the 8th, and I walked out of this aisle, out of this church, into a bone marrow transplant. 140 days, 104 days is a long time for sheep to be without a shepherd. Anything can happen in 104 days. Something can happen in 104 minutes. Where you been, preacher? You didn't go to Vegas. You didn't go to the Bahamas. Where you been, preacher? You didn't just disappear with no sense of foundation. Where you been, preacher? But don't just tell me where you have been. What you see? I know you're going to tell us that God talked to you. Well, I want to know what did he say to you? I've heard you over the years talk about he walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. But, but I want to know what new word. You've been locked up in a hospital room. You've been held captive in your own house. You've not had the liberty to talk with people as you normally talk to them. And you have had the opportunity to spend time with God. What did he say? Can I give you a shout right now? God's got to take you through a dry season before he gives you a due season. Somebody ought to shout right there. God's got to take you through a dry season in order to give you a new season. Some of y'all want a new season, but you don't want to go through the dry season. But every now and then, God gives you an experience where your back is up against a wall, where you have family, where you have friends, but you got to wait on him. There must be a dry season before your new season. And a whole lot of y'all want the new season, but you don't want to go through the dryness. The dryness gives you your testimony. I said your dryness gives you your testimony. The real shouters in the church are the people who can talk about how dry the season has been. But if I wait on him, and he may not come when I want him, but Anita Walker, if I wait on him, he may not come when I want him. But when he shows up, I said when he shows up, he's right on time. In the dry season, he's an on-time God. In the difficult times, he's an on-time God. In financial disarray, he's an on-time God. In unemployment, he's an on-time God. When your marriage breaks up, he's an on-time God. There must be a dry season before there's a due season. What did I learn when I pulled my disappearing act on you 104 days? I mean, the Bible says it's not good for sheep to be without a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. 
It's all right to have deacons, deaconesses, and trustees, but sheep need a shepherd. A shepherd not voted on by a pulpit committee, but a shepherd appointed by God. All a pulpit committee did 37 years ago was sanction what God had already ordained in eternity. And God knew, Julius, that in my 37th year, he would take me through a dry season. I never dreamed that I would have cancer. I've stood with you and I've stood with your relatives who have had that damnable malady. And many of them have been buried from this church, but the Lord said, I got a few more days yet for you. And I'm going to take you through a dry season, but when I bring you out, and place you in your due season. You thought you had preached before. You thought you had represented me before. But coming out of your bowels now will come proclamation that only a dry season can produce. 